Welcome to The Advocate, a program that thrashes out all the topical issues of the day. When you are in government, you don't see nothing wrong mm, with exactly. whatever is happening. The moment you are out there, everything is that wrong. Is, you can't even see yes. many women now, and when they're there, they're not even really making a mark, and then they have an NYSC problem, and this is that. Really? It's disastrous for a president to, even say to be he's unaware. unaware of it, the chief it's justice. It's a ploy. It could be a strategy. That strategy was it's a very, terrible. Like <laughs> terrible strategy. <laughs> because the box stops at your table. Whether it's that we don't look after our cities, and quite frankly, Nigeria is becoming a very ugly place. Mm. When you are the only one feeding the people with this news, and there is nobody countering them, it becomes, you know, the, the news. Hard times call for hard conversations. Welcome to The Advocate, where we tell it as it is, although not necessarily from the same perspective. To start us off, I'll be wasting no time in taking on the not so positive development of the noun, well, the army has denied it, Operation Positive ID. Victoria, a fresh yet seasoned advocate, will tackle the lack of affordable housing for the majority of Nigerians. I can suggest that a hardline approach is needed to inject some sober reality to our increasing culture of fake news. Well, there's nothing fake about Obi's advocacy, although a new kid on the block. She tackles the aged problem of inclusion in education. Meanwhile, Saidu will have us believe that our president's re recent return from a trip to Russia should be greeted with chants of, uh, I dare say it, daddy or yo-yo. Well, all this kicks off when we return after this break. So pardon me if this sounds like an oxymoron, but I'm compelled to ask, are we, what kind of democracy are we in? And I say this in light of the recent, um, well, now denied Operation Positive ID. I wonder if we're really in a democracy, if the story of the Nigerian army, which is constitutionally taxed with protecting the sovereignty of Nigeria against external ag aggression, we hear now, the, even though they've denied it strenuously, I might add, that it intended to commence operation, something called Operation Positive Identification across the country. The planned operation, which was supposed to commence November 2nd and end somewhere around the 23rd of December, will have seen soldiers nationwide mounting roadblocks and with sporadic checks to demand identity cards from citizens across the country. According to a report in by Premium Times, the positive identification operation will have seen soldiers probably accosting citizens on the street and highways and asking them to produce means of identification on the spot. So my question is, what kind of democracy is this if this were, would have been allowed to happen? And I know now that the army has strenuously denied it, as I said at the very beginning of this advocacy. But we need to ask ourselves this question, because this is very important. To hear that the army, the national army, our federal army, will be on the streets calls for grave concern. And I'm very happy that they've denied this, and I would like to see see, and indeed most Nigerians would like to see that this, is, this would not be the case at all. Um, we know that we face serious security challenges across the country. We have um, issues of kidnappings. We have the issues of banditry across the country. We have Boko Haram as well, and all kinds of problems. And I think the army should be tasked with focusing on external aggressions, especially within the Northeast. And where there's a breakdown of law and order, where the police are unable to deal with this problem, then we can, we can, using a presidential proclamation, ask the army to intervene along certain, and the lines of operation must be well spelt out for the army to, to come into the cities. Um, so this is really my advocacy for this week. Um, I can't say more because clearly the army has denied that this was going to happen. Um, and like I said, you know, it's up to my colleagues to, to weigh in and, and, and let's really discuss this potential problem, because if this was to be the case, then there's really no difference from us being back in a military, um, military regime um, to find soldiers on the streets of, of our major cities. Um, that was very worrisome, um, but I guess we could say cheers that um, that's not the case. Hey, who wants to kick us off? <laughs> I mean, well, can, can, yeah. can we say cheers yet? Because I don't Are think- Are we out of the woods? Yeah, have they really come out to say- They that? have, apparently. They said um, that the tweet that people are referencing was almost like photoshopped. There was something on another TV station where they said, you know, that um, the, the thing that had their logo on it was photoshopped and it wasn't from them. 
But, uh, you know, like he said, it is worrisome if it has come to that. Because I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm one of those who says, is there really smoke without fire? Mm -hmm. You know, why was the Senate debating it in the first place? Exactly. Did the Senate debate anything that comes up and happens to be, you know, like rumors? Um, unless it had some element of truth. Absolutely. And why did they let all the major newspapers carry the story? And channels, it reach, yeah, the, the you know? different newspapers. Because everywhere you yeah, turn, yeah. So, so clearly there was something there that made people think that there was cause yeah. for concern. And like you say, you know, even if you reference the fact that even the police make us uncomfortable, we are not still comfortable yeah. with police are your friend. Mm -hmm. How much more military are your friend? You know, we still have a problem with abusing power. You know, but on the other side, when I look at, you know, um, there was one story recently where they said there was a Boko Haram attack in the north. And within moments, you know, less than, you know, half the day, people returned because the military presence was there, they responded. So perhaps we could say it's been successful in the North to some extent. So we're not completely throwing it out altogether. So, so we're happy they're, they're, they're taking some sort of action. But we, like you say, maybe we need to look and say, assess how successful has it been so far in the North? And does it warrant, I don't think we, we, we believe it warrants I, okay, fine. the same kind I, of I thing in the South. Clear rules of engagement in terms of how the army should engage within the population. Okay. Um, I mean, within the northeast where we have uh, incidents of Boko Haram um, and, and terrorism, banditry, cross-border banditry, that obviously affects our territorial integrity. And I, I do believe that that is the army should step in, mm. since we, I mean, we don't have a national guard or something like that. I think and the army should, borders. yeah, we have very porous borders. I think the army should step in because that is their constitutional duty. Where I find that this this story you know, crosses the boundaries of what I think is normal, is, you know, this thing. And they let this thing fester for a couple of weeks. You know, uh, this thing started September. The first tweet was September 26th. Mm. And they're only now responding two days ago. Yeah. So a whole month went past. And they couldn't say they didn't hear it. Mm. The Senate debated it. The House of Reps debated it. And, you know, very many major newspapers and TV carried stations it. carried yeah. the story. It's and there was think, no pushback. I think, I think the pushback was what, you know, this... Quelled it. Give, yeah, give them a re rethink. But, um, so you honestly, think it was from them? You, you think well, that? I think maybe there was uh, there was a plan to implement something like that. Okay. You know, and this the was water. just this was just <laughs> you know. But if 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 you'd ask me really honestly, um, they were in a state of emergency in this country. Oh really? Yes. There are so many things that's happened recently with the border. Closure, for instance, mm. has opened us to a whole lot. It's, it's war on Nigeria. We've deprived countries of their uh, mainstay, you know. So, of course, there'll be a lot of things happening there. Mm. Now, there are things that they have not communicated. I believe that the problem, as with so many other policies, mm -hmm. is when you don't sell it, you don't propagate it properly. Let people you know, know what you're doing or what you intend to do mm -hmm. over time. And that's where the problem comes. Yeah. You know, they've not sold the idea that, look, mm -hmm. we need to police our borders. There are people coming in, illegal trade, yeah, illegal border foreigners. Border control is one thing, but internal yeah, but is I, another thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. I, I, I think I agree with Memeka um, when he started by, on the fresh note of thankfulness that it is not to be, considering the um, the denials, at least the strong denials from the authorities. But the issue is that why was it believable? Okay. Why did the story make the rounds? Why did it look real? Okay. And why did it look like something? Then it means that it's consistent with something that has been happening before. And what are those things? You mentioned something like border closure. Mm. There are um, other incidents like the... Um, um, the shrinking civic space in the country, where hardly any week passes without news of one journalist arrested, one okay. media house shut down, and we actually hosted a database of um, what we call database of closing civic spaces, where we've tracked about 200 incidents over the last close to 200 incidents. Okay. So, with all of those things That's happening, press, like press attacks, so. yes, not just press attacks, journalists, bloggers at the state level, at the federal levels, are you know happening around the country. So that trend, you know, infused some elements of believability okay. in the story. Mm -hmm. That probably influence media institutions to report it. And I thank, and it's thank, we are thankful to them for reporting Because we don't know if it was the reporting that. Yeah, but I think that's what they call kite flying. Okay. Yeah. Where you, you want to do something, but you're not sure. 
That's you fly a kite, yeah. and when you fly a kite and you push Nobody back, reacts. yeah, you when you see the push back mm. from the citizenry, then they would try to have everything. Mm. So I think that whether it was a, cli if a kite or not, or whatever it is that they intended to do, it would have led to massive violation of rights of citizens. Oh, absolutely. Um, to have crushed civil liberties, to have narrowed down the space for civic engagement. Mm. And that is not something that Nigeria should prioritize at a time like this. Mm. I, I completely agree. You know, I'm of the opinion that I think they have more important things to be doing than to be checking IDs. You know, <laughs> even with the fact that police can't even check IDs. You know, I think they really, I personally feel that it was going to happen. Oh, really? Yes, but at the end of the day, something changed. And that something might either be, are we going to get a situation, maybe the times that, you know, people had been killed due to military engagement, maybe that changed their mind. But I actually feel that along the way, they were actually focused on it being something that they would have put into place. Maybe for control, more control. But what are you controlling? We've asked for state police. You said no. Why bring army? Yeah. I, I, I think the army is the, federal the, control and, and as opposed to state control. I think the majority of Nigerians do not even have a proper means of um, government ID. Yes. themselves. You know, yeah. So how are you going to go about it? No, but you see, and, and again, that's where the abuse comes in. Because as it is, we already get harassed on the road. Yeah. And it's a, it's, a, it's a, do you say, preamble to obtaining bribes from us. So you can imagine yeah. if you have these people well, have around Christmas time. And I, 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 think, I think that, for me, I, I, I think that this was going to happen. But genuinely, the pushback, and they thought, thought about it. And wow. I really give, I, you know, I like to think that better sense prevailed, because mm -hmm. this will have led to um, um, a lot of problems. And, and, and I'm thankful to the civic space, to the media, to everybody concerned, including the army themselves, for having a, a rethink, um, or at least denying that this was going to happen. <laughs> um, so there's a time for facing off confrontational issues. After the break, Victoria lays bare another societal blight. Welcome to The Advocates, a program that thrashes out all the topical issues of the day. When you are in government, you don't see nothing wrong mm, with exactly. whatever is happening. Mm. The moment you are out there, everything is that wrong. Is, you can't even see yes. many women now, and when they're there, they're not even really making a mark, and then they have an NYSC problem, and this and that. Really? It's disastrous for a president to, even say to be he's unaware. unaware of it, the chief it's justice. It's a ploy. It could be a strategy. That strategy was it's a very, very <laughs> terrible strategy. <laughs> because the box stops at your table. Whether it's that we don't look after our cities, and quite frankly, Nigeria is becoming a very ugly place. Mm. When you are the only one feeding the people with this news, and there is nobody countering them, it becomes, you know, the, the news. You are watching The Advocate on Plus TV Africa. Nigeria must be home to all of its citizens, or it isn't home at all. So I'll be talking about shelter for all Nigerians. Is it a right or a mirage? Housing, often interchangeably called shelter, is an indispensable human need. Shelter is essential not only for the protection from the elements, but also for privacy, sanctity of family life, health, and emotional well-being. In short, to our fundamental dignity as human beings. Recognizing the central importance of shelter to human existence, Section 16, sub 2 of the 1999 Constitution provides as follows. The state shall direct its policy towards ensuring that the material resources of the nation are harnessed and distributed as best as possible to serve the common good, and that adequate and suitable shelter, suitable and adequate food, reasonable national minimum living wage, old care, Old age care and pensions, employment, sick benefits, welfare of the disabled are provided for all citizens. But today, the housing deficit in Nigeria is currently estimated at 20, 17 to 20 million housing units, increasing annually by 900,000 units, with a potential cost of 60 trillion naira needed to fill this gap. Lagos State alone has a deficit of about 3 million housing units. Because adequate shelter is still a mirage to many residents of a mega city like Lagos, especially those on low incomes or the very poor, they resort to seeking a roof over their head anyhow and anywhere space avails. The result is that from the initial 42 slums identified in Lagos in the mid-80s, the number has now skyrocketed to over 100 slum communities and still counting. 
it's not a surprise that the World Bank reports that two out of three people in Lagos live in slums. So how are states responding to the proliferation of slums? Are they building more homes that are affordable, affordable to the masses and within the reach of the most vulnerable and those in critical need of shelter? On what and what are states spending the huge budgets appropriated every year for the benefits of citizens? On the contrary, rather, unplanned settlements are under siege as arbitrary forced evictions are routinely carried out using several headings and excuses such as crime control, city beautification, flood management, gutter constructions, setback enforcement, and so forth, displacing hundreds of thousands of people annually. Minimum wage in Nigeria today is about 18,000 naira or 30,000 naira, depending on the state you live in. Landlords also require upwards of one to two years rent at once. So if you're earning 30K, 30,000, you need at least 16 to 24 months to save one year rent. Yet, Government issues notices for just seven days before they evict communities. As evidenced by research findings, official emphasis is being placed on buildings and other public structures that neither contribute to the state's housing stock or nor tackle affordability crisis in the state. Therefore, it is safe to conclude that the provision of affordable shelter is not among the priorities, top priorities of states. There are council flats in London there are cooperative houses in Germany. There are social housing flats in South Africa. We also used to have what they call hotel dollar homes. These are different models adopted by various countries to ensure that citizens, especially the poor among them, live in dignity and have decent shelter. Are these ideas alien to Nigeria? Are these pro people models impossible to replicate here in Nigeria? I urge every one of you watching this show to join us in appealing to the federal and state government to make housing for all, a top priority towards the realization of the Sustainable Development Goal 11, which is to make cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. It is indeed possible for the hope of decent shelter to move from a mere mirage to full possibility. That hope is realizable. I mean, it's not only possible, it's absolutely necessary. You know, yeah. We don't really have a choice. I feel sick to the stomach when I hear this kind of thing. Honestly, I do. Because when I drive down the road, there's no day I don't drive past someone sleeping. Today I drove past someone sleeping on the middle road on Ozumbambadi Way, mm -hmm. on the hard concrete. You know, and then yesterday I drove past someone in the rain with something like tarpaulin, just sitting by some rubbish. I'm thinking, is this a human being? And we don't seem to understand that if you neglect, like what you said at the beginning, if it's not home to all, then it's not home at all. If you neglect the least, if the weakest people are being left and you continue to just... Because you said, what are they spending the money on? And, and, and you know, you had research, which you know, maybe you'll table if we have time, you know, to show that they're spending money on themselves. The, the, the government are spending money to find them, their own housing when they have money allocated to spend on the citizens. And they don't seem to understand that if you let these poor people, if you neglect the welfare of the poor, then eventually it's going to come back to, to haunt you, you know. And I, only yesterday I was hearing the story of um, a guy who did um, the virtual story in, in Chibok, you know, Daughters of Chibok. And when he tells you how this, these Chibok people have been neglected since the, the furor, they're there. They haven't had any post-therapy trauma, anything. So 33 parents have died as a result of the trauma they faced from losing their children. The lady who was narrating the story is still waiting for her daughter to come back. She's still washing her clothes and folding her clothes. They don't have manure, even for the groundnut farming they're doing. So it's like they're forgotten, deserted people. And we seem to think it's their problem. Is it their problem? Is it the problem of these people that you're neglecting them to the point where they don't have any sustenance? What do you really want them to do? And, you know, so... Something must be done. That's why I say I feel sick to the stomach because we can't afford to neglect one in you know two out of three people living in slums. I mean that's crazy. That's really crazy. I, I think I think government is overwhelmed by. Are they overwhelmed? They, They're they busy must, building they must, their own houses. They Are they must, overwhelmed? They yeah, they They're must be because if you look at the, the uh, magnitude of problem. We're talking health care, no, no. we're They're talking still education. They're for themselves, sorry, it's not overwhelming. But for this, my own uh, take on this is, you know, we might have to rethink our policy on housing. And I would want to take it back to education. You know, do we really have to depend on, you know, the traditional way of building? Absolutely. Can we start to research, you know, cheaper and, you know, environmentally friendly methods. what she was saying. You know, yeah. that would help, you know, boost uh, mass production houses that are less than two million, three million naira. 
You know, those, those are the kind of things that we need to challenge in higher institutions. Yeah, give an account. But these are initiatives that must be driven by, you know, uh, advocates. Yeah. Yeah. All of them. I, I think that, um, you know, um, I agree with Seydou that um, alternative um, models of building mass housing has to be faced. It doesn't have to be those huge block of flats. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. um, you know, we can find alternative methods, uh, you know, in building, and, uh, and that's very critical. But on a larger picture um, that I worry about is this absence of care mm -hmm. that, and I don't think government is overwhelmed. No, uh, thank I, you. I, 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 because they're managing to do I, what I, they need I, to do I, for I totally themselves. I totally disagree with that. Government <laughs> I, is not overwhelmed. No, they're distracted. They just have a different set of priorities. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. The priorities Absolutely. is looking after those of themselves. Uh, ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. And they're not even doing a good job at that. Yeah. They're just, you know, because yeah. even if you look at the so-called uh, banana island, yeah. uh, Koi, it's, it's, it's not just sinking, these are glorified slums. It's still a slump because the, the, there's no infrastructure. There's Once it's drainage, it drain, yeah. there's, there's flooding everywhere. It's a, we're not addressing a fundamental issue of how to build a society that's more inclusive, that accepts that they're going to be rich, yeah. the middle class, and the poor. Mm -hmm. And there should be a minimum standard of living. And that is the critical core, that yeah. there's that absence. So it's like, let's just take you know, whatever we can for ourselves Absolutely. and whoever, you know, fight for yourself. And that's the madness that we, we, we're having in society. I mean, from my point of view, you know, I do a lot of work in the northern states and I go to places like Jaws, Kaduna, Kano and things like that. But what find, I find so amazing about those places is that they actually do not have low cost housing. So I'm asking myself, where are the low cost housing for these people? I mean, even when I go to Akwaibom, I go to Eket and things, there's no... Quite, you know, there's no, no, um, you know, low cost housing. So, where do those poor people live? Nobody seems to be answering those questions. And when they do make homes, it tends to be yeah. for themselves. And those houses are left unoccupied. Most of the houses you find yeah. in, in Abuja, most of the houses, no, no, because they're hoping to get rent yeah. for it. Yeah. Yes, I, th I think um, when the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Right Adequate Housing visited Nigeria, that was in September. And after her assessment, she found out that the majority of housing estates in Lagos and Abuja are vacant, empty, unoccupied. And she recommended to the Nigerian government to impose a tax yes. on those buildings because you cannot they have such so massive homelessness and inadequacy of shelter and at the same time have you know, so many houses that are unoccupied. And, and they are unoccupied, they are vacant because they are un unaffordable. So all or nothing can be a good negotiation stand. After the break, Ekene is all for truth with a zero tolerance stance on fake news. A line of enforcement can also serve as a line of separation, the fake from the truth. I'm going to be talking about Davido, wannabe baby mama, and the fake world of social media. Most of us, even those of us who have little or no appetite for social media gossip, couldn't help but overhear snippets of a young lady who presented herself as a concerned friend accusing new dad and husband Davido of impregnating her friend. Apparently, this is what social media breeds. Since then, the girls involved have come out to say they were sorry and that they were only joking, essentially a media stunt. The bottom line, though, is that a lot of us are satisfied that Davido says he's taking the matter to the authorities. However, it is troubling that we're, rise, we're raising a generation that are fixated on opportunism and fake news. Against the backdrop of the fact that the government are going after those it feels are hate speech propagators with increased fines and criminal convictions, are we not in danger of shooting ourselves in the foot? Remember the childhood chants, liar, liar, pants on fire? Well, it would seem that our penchant for propagating lies is igniting a flame that will eventually end up setting our pants on fire. We're discrediting the only avenue left to us in an increasingly despotic society of challenging authority and holding them accountable. After all, if some of what we say is made up, then why should anything that catches fire on social media be given any credibility? Since it, it could all be classed as fake news, as recently with the Mecca's advocacy. A certain United States president knows enough to tout this as his get out of jail or even Trump card. Parents is actually a matter of our nation's survival to inculcate a culture of truthfulness 
in our children. Teachers, we must uphold truthfulness as a bastion of our institutions. Social media hosts and users have a crucial role to play. We all must report and see that those who knowingly broadcast fake news are sanctioned. There must be strict and consistent punishment for those who would play footloose with the truth. We're talking laying foundations here. Till then, I'm behind anyone who takes fake news propagators to task, as this is one way we can drive home the point that crimes affected in an increasingly fake world of social media have very real consequences. You know, um, okay, this is, this is, we live in the age of, we've we talked about this before mm. on a previous episode, of my truth, their truth, mm. our, truth our truth, that relativism that's going on. Okay. Uh, but however you cut it, the truth is under attack. Um, we're just seeing, I'm sorry to bring some international perspective to this, the issue in the United States mm. where um, a certain you know, the president of the United States is under attack or facing impeachment, mm -hmm. and people are saying to him, oh, I, I was there, I heard this. <laughs> and people are coming after the people who are reporting and saying, no, no, no he's a liar. Mm -hmm. He didn't say So they're trying to discredit the notion of truth. And I think the tools and the institutions that we currently have um, are quite not adequate in addressing the power, the dimensional power of digital. Yeah. Let, let's just face that. The same thing when it appears in, with elections whether it be in America or Russia or Nigeria, where this concept of fake news, um, um, and it happened, if we, if we take our mind historically, um, six, in, the, in the 16th century, the 14th century, when media got perversive, the printing press and so on and so forth, you know, people started to have rag sheets. Everybody could now print. Okay. The same thing happened. Now it, it became controlled, but now in the age of digital, it is so pervasive that with my phone, I'm, I'm both a publisher and a broadcaster. So I think the, 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 the world needs to face up to the reality and institutions need to face up to the reality that everyone can tell their own story. And that story has a potential, not just to go to, because you know, if I send you a message, if I send a message to Seidu mm -hmm. on Snapchat or WeChat or WhatsApp, <laughs> that he can actually frame that message I send him, screenshot it, and send it mm -hmm. to masses. Yeah, that's the whole lesson of Twitter. So, 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 so <laughs> the, the fact of it is mm. that the dimension in which information flows and it disseminates creates these bubbles. I, I think we just need to, you know, because there's this thing where people say, oh, let's control. I mean, you hear the mm. government say, we have to control social media. I, I don't think they even know how, how, to. how to. No, they can't. Um, mm. You know, even China that's got the tools, because if you don't control your internet, you cannot control social media. Yeah, yeah. We don't control our internet, so how are you going to control? control yeah. um, um, so let's be very careful. We, we, the truth. We can control our internet, actually. Mm. We can. Yes. Then we will not, you will not find banking. You will not be able to get POS. Let's be very clear. The, the way the information flows, it's not, it's not that simple. Mm. And I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just looking at it more from yeah, our I mean, point I mean, of view, I mean, but yeah. I, mean, I, want, I, want, I agree with every, mm. almost everything you said, but there is also another angle that I have been reflecting on, um, which is the increasing trend of popul populism okay. built on nothingness, yes. where our society is increasingly creating mega stars, not because they are Five brilliant, of fame. <laughs> not because they have any talent, not because they have any skill, not because of their intellect. They just put cameras on somebody. That's noise making. And you become a celebrity overnight. And everybody, and there's so much reward. The reward for that is enormous. There are a lot of entertainment shows but, but, where you spend but, but time we, doing nothing. Yes, we live and in an attention economy. Economy. I, want, I want to know where she's going yes, with it. But you, you reap enormous benefits for that nothingness. Mm. Whereas there are other like mathematical competitions where it requires you to put a lot of mental effort and energy. You get a mug at the end of the exercise. So. <laughs> What we have more. created a message to our younger generation that value, hard work does not pay. I disagree with that. There's now no, the, there is there is because a, in this there, same, wait, 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 there is a wait, drift. No, no, wait, wait, I want that to learn. There is a I, I drift really want to know what she's doing. populism. Yes. And these young girls, I didn't I don't I didn't yeah. really follow the story, right. but there is an opportunity that I can just say something. I'm blue. You know, I'm blue. But they have blown. But well, let me say this though. <laughs> because Davido took them, you know, arrested them uh, and now is released that they were them. Blue? Oh, wait, wait, listen. And now release them uh, and Davido. We know what they are, we know what they do. Wait, wait. Davido with 
20, 30 million followers or what, mm -hmm. tweeted pictures of them after their release in a swimming pool, mm -hmm. playing his song, oh, and those crazy. girls now, their following has like, Exploded. they now have almost a million following. Mm. In. So listen, and they've met that they do. In this same age of populism, mm. Mm. yeah? And if you say this, that values don't matter, value matters to those who want value to matter to them. The, the truth of the matter is that people push a picture of a different reality that's different from the reality that they're facing. I can live in one flat somewhere and pretend You're that in I'm New York. in New York. <laughs> Tie a scarf. The reality is the reality mm. for me as an individual. So what are you saying? Yeah, my point is actually no, I'm validating it to the extent yeah. that this is what we observe. Yeah. But that doesn't negate the fact that even within the reality, even within the life we live now, that people who want to make sense of it still do, still use the same tools. The girls okay, so we, we shouldn't demonize yeah. social media. Oh, yeah, I, said, I don't think we should demonize. Yeah. That's my point. Oh, it, it, oh, it is a tool. Yeah. It's like a, it's like yeah. a knife. Yeah. Those who want to use it to do good, we'll yeah, use it to, to do make good. a good meal. That's my I point. Think I, social media is, mm -hmm. is such a powerful tool mm -hmm. yeah. that um, we're still kind of like getting around to, you know, how do we go around managing. Like, these girls, I don't think they really set out to cost this kind of. They wanted traction, they wanted attention yeah. to mm -hmm. themselves. They wanted life. Right? And, uh, it blew out of proportion, mm. right? Um, for government, social media is one tool that we've been able to use to hold them accountable. Yeah, that's my you problem understand? with it's the whole tool. saga. But it, it now flows both ways. Both ways. Mm. Because people now use that same tool to decimate, yeah. uh, dis, uh, dis, uh, dissipate yes. wrong or false information. Yeah. Yeah. So how do we regulate or how do we you know, control the space. So that it can still be useful so to us. So what they're saying yeah. is, look, we don't have anything against you expressing yourself, having, you know, that medium to express your ideas or your beliefs and, you know. But recognize the power of what you have in your but hand. But there, there, there must be consequence yeah. for yeah. every action. And an take. individual and that's level. Yeah. That's my point. Yeah. You don't yeah. control the whole thing because one person or okay. ten okay. persons, Sorry, let, 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 if, let, let, if they misbehave, uh, uh, deal with the individuals who have misbehaved. But that's, but that's my point. Sorry, uh, Biagini, no, but to say because you want to regulate it, that's where I find it. Wait, wait, please go ahead. Sorry, allow Biagini to just... For me, I, yeah. I, I, I stand, you know, with Victoria in the sense that we've begun to have a society which says hard work doesn't pay. Yes. You know, and I think we really, so really need to down. step back and start um, reintroducing the values that I would believe our parents gave us. And the thing about it is that how did we as a generation... Um, lose it. How did we lose our values? How do we lose Probably our every systems? generation okay. loses it. Okay. Yes. <laughs> and gain something. Okay. Yes, it's, it's, uh, a trade -off. Something. it's a trade-off. It's a trade-off. You and I grew up. Yes. Our parents, I'm sure, they were they were scandalized at some of the things we did in our generation. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So so you know, I mean, when you look at videos or pictures of in the '60s, people wearing those short skirts, I'm sure their own parents were like, were oh, yeah, 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 look yeah, at what yeah. it is. So every generation loses or done something. Yeah. Okay. It's a trade-off. Uh, and we, I think we'll have to carry this one over to the next conversation because clearly I still have much to say on this but let's let's just pause for breath okay so we've dissected the issues now and here's where you dissect our advocacies on the topic closing the borders up there was lots of discussion there up black people up Africa says hundred percent right to shut off borders it's high time to make Nigeria great again <laughs> I wonder where that came from Nigeria is not a dumping ground for other nations so closing borders will help Nigeria's own industries Enough is enough. Nigeria first. I, I sounding very much like something we've heard before. On whether church is bad for your overall well-being, Anyi Amp says, Nigerians should understand that religion and church is not important. What is needed for a country and people to develop is godliness. Okay? On the advocates in general, uh, Simon Templer, nice name, says, I really love this show. Very honest, sincere, and to the point. Not to mention educative. No sugar coating and no banter based on religious ethnic bias. Thank you, guys. Always, always watch the show on YouTube from the United States. Thank you, Simon Templer. We'll keep speaking on the topical issues that matter to all of us. Keep your comments coming in on our social media platforms on Facebook, Plus TV Africa, hashtag The Advocates NG, or on Twitter and Instagram at Plus TV Africa, hashtag The Advocates NG. To catch up with previous broadcasts, please go to www.plustvafrica.com slash The Advocate. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Plus TV Africa. 
After the break, Obi takes us to school and teaches us that integration and inclusion are not necessarily the same thing. Hmm, I'm keen to find out the distinction. Welcome to The Advocate, a program that thrashes out all the topical issues of the day. When you are in government, you don't see nothing wrong mm, with exactly. whatever is happening. The moment you are out there, everything is that wrong. Is, you can't even see yes. many women now, and when they're there, they're not even really making a mark, and then they have an NYSC problem, and this and that. Really? It's disastrous for a president to, even say to be he's unaware. unaware of it, the chief it's justice. It's a ploy. It could be a strategy. That strategy was it's a terrible, terrible. <laughs> terrible strategy. <laughs> because the box stops at your table. Whether it's that we don't look after our cities, and quite frankly, Nigeria is becoming a very ugly place. Mm. When you are the only one feeding the people with this news, and there is nobody countering them, it becomes, you know, the, the news. I'm not one for plain lip service. If you say you do something, then do it convincingly. What do we understand by inclusive education? Inclusive education means that all students attend and are welcomed by their neighbors, their neighboring schools, in an age-appropriate regular classroom and are supported to learn. Contributions, participations, and every aspect of the school life is done in that inclusive setting. Inclusive education is about how we develop and design our schools, classrooms, programs, activities, so that all students learn and participate together. Inclusive education is about ensuring the quality of education for all our students by effectively meeting their needs in a way that is responsive, acceptable, respectful and supportive in the common learning environment. What are the advantages of a supportive learning environment? It enables the children or students to fully participate in learning in the environment whereby they're able to share things with their peers in the chosen educational setting. It provides a positive climate, promoting a sense of belonging and ensuring students progress together in the appropriate personal, social, emotional and academic space with goals. The concept is responsible to individual learning needs to take time to specifically look at the level that each child is being taught and the practice and the principles are communicated. Common learning environment provides is an inclusive educational system whereby we must mix children who may be at a lower peer level in the same setting, same environment, and same group. That's why the passing of the Discrimination Against Persons with Disabilities Act by President Buhari on the 23rd of January 2018, which states that a person with a disability should have the unfettered right to education without discrimination or, dis or segregation in any form. We still see Nigerian schools practicing integration and in some institutions still practicing segregation. So I would say integration, what do I mean? Segregation, we know what that means. But integration means a system whereby children with special educational needs are educated on the same platform with children that don't have needs and are given the basic um, educational setting. But the important factor here is the duty of care the duty of care, and I repeat myself, the duty of care. This is a common practice that we have established now, whereby integration is taking over inclusion. Inclusive education differs from integration or mainstreaming models of education, which tends to be concerned principally with educating the child with the disability, as opposed to making it inclusive for all. By contrast, inclusive education is the right of the child to participate in school and the duty of care is on the school to be able to make sure that that child has everything he needs despite the fact that he has a disability. My question therefore to this forum is, how many Nigerians are aware of the Disability Act? How many schools are prepared for inclusive education? Are we willing as a people to accept children with various physical and mental needs in our mainstream school? That's what I thought. Jump in quickly so that I know that this one might. 
Keep you know, because I, I know, you know, your integration and inclusion, if I get you right, you're basically saying it's one thing to put them there. It's another thing to actually make them welcome. Yes. And make sure that, you know, they don't, they feel a part of the group. Yes. Okay. And that's what leads me to my own understanding and where I want to take it from. You know, laws are one thing. You asked that we are aware of the law. Yeah. You know, laws are one thing. How you actually make it applicable is another. So you have a legal setting where people accept, you know, there's a rule here that you should accept anybody. But mm. it, you know, the heart is quite a different matter. Mm. If people personally then take it on board, if somehow they buy into it, then the law, they, they will supersede the law. Yes. You know, where you now have to start policing schools to make sure they do it by the letter, you've lost altogether. So I just want to give an illustration because I have two children on, on the autistic spectrum. On the autistic spectrum. My daughter goes to a Sunday school, you know, so she's going to be 16. And she's in the Sunday school at church. And they just put her there. And because her sister is now old enough to be in the same Sunday school, she tells me, ah, you know, Chinere is here, she's not doing anything, you know, shouldn't I move her? And I'm like, oh, because she's there now, she's my eyes. I then go to the teacher there very quickly and I say, is there no way you can engage her? I know she doesn't have the same understanding, she's not able to communicate in the same way, but if you're telling a story about, say, David and Goliath, can you not, she likes coloring, can you not give her? So I start suggesting. You know, the lady is almost like taking her back and I'm thinking, but in my mind, I'm thinking, I'm aghast. Why didn't you think, oh, you're a teacher, you're a Sunday school teacher, so you, you want to. Include. She wants to go the extra mile. Yeah. But it's clear that people are, sometimes they're in a flow. I don't think she doesn't want to do it, but she's in a flow. She's in a certain way of doing things. And she hasn't actually thought to herself, oh, I want to go the extra mile. I want to see how I can get into this girl. And she's been coming for over a year. And it hasn't dawned on this teacher to say, so I think it's a partnership. That's really where I'm going. Parents have to want to help you will have to want to put their children in that common space and you know generally partner with the public to to make them more it, acceptable it, in that space i hope i'm making yes sense. Uh, you're right yeah. but then i also say it's it's about reasonable adjustment if you want to sit down and take care of children you have to be mindful that all the children will not be the same so you don't have to you know you, it, it's not you something you don't have to wait for the parents so i feel that a lot of these issues of not being ready for um, inclusive education stems from curriculum. Okay. What is the curriculum? What are the teachers being taught mm -hmm. from the time when they what actually are their become, targets? What are their targets? What are their goals? Mm. Some of them don't believe they will actually see these children in schools because a lot of us have kept our children at home. But what we are saying now is that if you don't become the advocate of your child, your child is never going to get yes. the justice needed. Yes, exactly. So you as a parent, and it actually starts from church. You need to take your children, whatever the disability is, even with the drooling, there, yes. they're spitting, they need to be sitting with you in the church. Mm. Some parents don't go to church because they're ashamed, because the child makes too much noise. Mm. So what's the essence of being your, your, well, your, neighbor, your, neighbor, your neighbor, or mm. uh, you know, my neighbor, mm. my neighbor's friend, yeah. so to speak? I think that, um, first of all, I, I, you know, I, I want to commend um, this administration for passing the, the yes. discrimination yes. against persons with disabilities yeah. act. So mm. I think that's, that's a very important step mm. in, you know, in, in, in this direction, because I think that recognition at the highest level of, of government that, you know, there's discrimination that's going on and we need to put a stop to it. I yeah. think that's very, very, very important. And mm -hmm. I also will say that the, you know, even though a lot of people have put a lot of stick on it, the recent Ministry of, uh, of you know, um, Social Welfare, yeah. I think if they're tasked with this responsibility to push this information, um, but on a more general, because I like to look at, you know, the bigger the picture. Global picture. Yeah. The bigger picture for me here is that, sadly, on this score, the administration, this administration hasn't done so well in terms of education, okay. prioritizing education. Mm. Because education goes to the very heart of our future. Yeah. It goes to the very heart of even how we see ourselves. I think that they need to put more money on it. I saw that this year's budget, you know, it wasn't, it was as if... Six percent. Uh, yeah. We need to do, go, go upwards, even yeah. 10, 12, maybe even 14 percent. Invest in it, training yeah, teachers. Especially invest in training teachers. Okay. And then let them recognize this aspect. The aspect that is critical because a lot more people will, leave, will now eat all kinds of things. People are going to be born with all kinds of things. You're going to find more people on the having on the, children on the, with, with, with yeah on that on that spectrum. Just, 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 no, 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 true. I, I'm linking it. To, ahead, to, I was just going to add mm. that you know yes, these are all the you know the trickling effect yeah. from mm. not setting priorities. You know, if we would commit more funds to education and you know training, carrying all the stakeholders, the teachers. Parents. Understanding how they would, you know, like the graduated uh, learning for understanding that these kids have different learning needs, 
you know, and understanding that. So we need to allocate more funds to education because that's the only way we could, you know, drive this economy. Very yeah. important. Yeah, I, I, um, the point, I agree with most, most of you have shared, but the aspect about money is where I might deviate a bit because there's this tendency to always throw money at yeah. problems. Yeah. The problem is not the money. Yeah. The problem is there is emphasis on duty of care. Duty of care is something that flows from the heart. This is where I was. It doesn't require from. money. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I agree. What kind of teachers? Mm -hmm. he, currently, people go into teaching when they have searched for a job in the job, in the banks, in the oil companies, in the telecom. They've searched everywhere. And two, three, four, five years, somebody will not say, that would not know who's that is, go and find a teaching job. <laughs> yes, the last yes. bus stop. That's, that's, that's the last stop. stop. They actually go into it out of frustration. Mm -hmm. That is the person you are talking about care to. It's not care. It's not money that will solve that yeah, problem. So there is the, the conversation is that before you are admitted into the educational system, there is a level of training. Compassion. In those days, there's those they have, they have to have TTC teacher training colleges, where you go through a different model and curriculum. You are taught, you learn, and you, you, le you don't just learn teaching methods, you also learn empathy, empathy. and compassion. Yes. So those are not financial Money. problems. No, they're not. They're, they're not financial problems. So that is where we have to go back to the recruitment process for that Disability Act to work. Go back to the teacher We're recruitment models this. and totally reject that process. Then we can start all the way up. Okay. This advocacy was as much to enlighten as it was to stir us up to action. After the break, Saidu seems to be stirring up an increasingly uncommon sentiment by his advocacy. It sort of resembles optimism. Welcome to The Advocate, a program that thrashes out all the topical issues of the day. When you are in government, you don't see nothing wrong mm, with exactly. whatever is happening. The moment you are out there, Everything is that wrong. Is, you can't even see yes. many women now, and when they're there, they're not even really making a mark, and then they have an NYSC problem, and this is that. Really? It's disastrous for a president to, even say to be he's unaware. unaware of it, the chief it's justice. It's a ploy. It could be a strategy. That strategy was it's a very, terrible. Like <laughs> terrible strategy. <laughs> because the box stops at your table. Whether it's that we don't look after our cities, and quite frankly, Nigeria is becoming a very ugly place. Mm. When you are the only one feeding the people with this news, and there is nobody countering them, it becomes, you know, the, the news. The return leg of a journey should be more celebrated than the departure, don't you think? From Russia with love. The recent visit of President Buhari to Russia was met with mixed feelings by Nigerians. While some believe he should have stayed at home at his duty post and faced the myriads of issues bedeviling the country and not embark on another jamboree, others are of the opinion that he should, as the president of Africa, most Africa's most populous nation and largest economy, must be present at Russia's Africa summit. The truth is, Nigeria has always had a good diplomatic relationship with Russia. As a matter of fact, Russia supported Nigeria both politically and militarily during the Civil War. President uh, Obasanjo visited Russia in March 2001, during which it said a declaration on the principle of friendly relation and partnership was signed. Also in June 2009, then President Dmitry Medvedev made an official visit to Nigeria. It was the first visit by any Russian leader to our country. It is now evident that Russia is interested in making a comeback into Africa. After years of being her political patron, Russia is now ready to solicit for Africa's business, and Nigeria, as the continent's largest economy, must position herself to a large chunk of Russia's investments. We can make do of Russia's know-how to resuscitate Ajakuta steel mill, ride on her technology to build a nuclear power plant to solve our perennial power problem or tap from high investments in railway to develop our ailing transport system, or even develop our oil and gas sector through appropriate partnership and investments. They can modernize and retool our military to cope with the demands of fight against terrorism and insurgency. Russia has donated 12 MI-35 attack helicopters to Nigeria. In my opinion, I think the president did well in securing Russia's commitment to partner with Nigeria in key areas highlighted above, 
in the end, it wasn't a jamboree, and we should commend Mr. President. However, what is not clear is the implementation timelines of these commitments. First of all, let me. Let me, let me, let me first of all, <laughs> you guys I, couldn't I, wait. I was first, everybody was. First, first of all, let me <laughs> declare. Let me declare. Okay, I'm first of the. That you, you, you. First, first of all, mm. let me declare. Mm. Yeah. I love Putin, so I'm going to be biased. I do. Right, right. Yes, I do. Okay, that's yeah. like, yeah. Yeah. So, 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 I do. So, 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 I think Putin is a man. Yeah, um, he puts his money where he's. No, no, no. No, no. Let's not get to the side. I'm not going to glamorize. Land your point. Let me come. But I said, let me put it out there first. Yeah, so, so, that, so your yeah, bias is exposed. So that my bias is exposed. I like that. Um, I, I think we need, we need a measure. Why do you love oh, I can't I even understand. Uh, why, I love you him. know, why do I? Because uh, he's, 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 he's provided a counterbalance yeah. to this hegemony that America under Obama was pushing. Okay. And, and, and you know, I mean, they messed up so many countries and Russia was a bulwark against them continuing to mess up the okay. whole. So I like that. Keep and I, you know, I mean, and he's lifted Russia out of the doldrums. You really? Yes, he has. Okay. It's not perfect. No, no ah, one is. Ah. Uh, but I, you know, I, so I've declared my bias. Okay. But here, here's the thing, though. Um, I think from, from, you know, um, every China did this, Europe did this, France did theirs, oh, America did Africa. theirs. Everybody's wooing Africa. Everybody recognizes that Africa is the last frontier. Um, you know, I mean, for most countries, rather than thinking of going to Mars or whatever planets everybody's thinking of, Africa is really. The bride. Well, the bride mm -hmm. of, of the world. Um, so Russia is no exception. And I think, you know, we need this competitiveness. And I, I like to think that, you know, and I agree with Saidu, um, yes, our president travels a lot. That is undisputable. There's no, there's no arguing that. He's off to but, England next. Yeah, but the reality is we do need uh, a Russia play. Okay. To act as some kind of um, counterbalance, but I think we need to we need to be very strategic and very smart about okay. you know because now everybody's looking to Africa, looking to Nigeria, largest economy, two hundred plus million people, very you know um, intelligent people. But how do we? What is our play? Because as someone said, I was listening, I followed this guy on Instagram, Vuzi, who's a motivational speaker and all that. He says, "What is Africa's play?" Mm -hmm. Because everybody has, a, uh, Europe has a strategy for Africa. Of course. America has a strategy this for is, Africa. Uh, what, is, what, is, what, is, what is Africa's, Africa's strategy? strategy? What is Nigeria's for strategy for the world yes. and, and more specifically for, for Russia? Okay, okay. What do we want from them? It's not just so much what they want. From us. And, uh, from so Saidu so outlined some of these things, but the timeline to it and the strategic, you know, um, the method in which we we'll go about getting what we want yes. is usually where the problem is. Yes, I, I just want to come in on that point because uh, we mustn't forget that Russians are masters of chess. So I'm sure they've thought several steps down the line. Are we thinking likewise? Or if not, I'm sorry to sound like doom and gloom. What we saw with PNID will just be appetizer when they finish. I'm sorry to sound like I'm really skeptical about Russia. I've been to Russia, by the way. Yeah. But I just think to myself, Zradzuche, those who speak Russian. But, but I just want to say, though, I don't know how I get excited about Russia. But I just want to say, <laughs> you love, you love yeah. I just want to say that. I just feel that there's something slightly dubious about the Russian play. And, and we're right to be suspicious about them, simply because look at people who they, they don't have scruples to do with people, countries like Syria to do with nuclear weapons. They will just they will play their own. Well, America they, has they, scruples. They can, I'm coming now. I'm coming. Let's play scruples. it out. I'm coming. But these Americans are still hedged in by some of the, 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 the tenants, you say, of democracy. Can you imagine a country that can oh go into goodness. England? Oh my, oh I'm coming, let me finish, let me finish. I can't imagine a country that can go into England and take out somebody. And till now, they can't link the takeout. Oh, US went into you know, can you imagine, Zaya, took up, um, uh, can you imagine a country uh, the leaders like of, that? Of no, and, and, and they want to resuscitate their image as a world power. You know, they want to be back on the stage. So they're happy to make use of us. Even the whole Ajakuta still thing. I said, keep an eye on that one. So like I'm saying, my own emphasis will still be Let's just plan it well. Let's not get tripped on the fact that, oh, Russia wants us, we want Russia. What are we? They're, they're not Father Christmas. They're not a charity. So if they're offering us right. something, yeah. they clearly have a, a, a back end. They have a, a game plan. What is our game plan? And that's where I don't trust all this excitement. I think we don't usually plan ahead. And we usually then end up looking like we're surprised. Again, I want to say PNID will just look like child's play if, if, we're, not, if we're not organized. You know, there, there's an Igbo proverb that says, when a woman marries two husbands, she will know which one was better. Okay. So, um, the, there are good sides and bad sides to everything. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's same with this. The good side is that before we used to have power blocks, increasingly power is becoming dispersed. Yeah. There is, in the next five, 10 years, or even less than that, there will be no more power block, global power block. 
because the power will be so dispersed. So an Africa may have a role to play in that process. The thing, my sense of public international law tells me that every country acts in its yeah, own best, best interest. interest. Okay. True, not just of Russia. Course. So when you talk about Russia, I wouldn't talk down Russia. No, I wouldn't even think that Russia's intentions are more noble or darker than any other country. I agree that with you. Thank you. Know, you. Know, they've yeah. been, they've been Thank you. you know, all of them have the same the intention. Yeah, the the same intention and the are you, me first. Me first. Oh, and that, and that intention is like they first, we later on. Not even but later. we're not putting ourselves first. So Ben, the, the question for me is not what Russia is coming to do. I, because what, they're coming to do what those that have the come before have, have done. Coming. My priority is, and that should be Nigeria's priority. What do we want out of this? What is the need yeah. for us? Mm. True. Do we have the type of leaders that have that negotiating ability for to get the best to get the best out of the deal for Nigeria? Mm -hmm. Are they going to go? No. When I well, you kept on referring to PNI, PNI yes. and I. Yes. Nigerians were part of the deal. That's what I'm saying. I had even the former justice of the Supreme Court. Of course. Was part of those That's advising people against your own sovereignty. Yeah, I heard that. So the, the question is, are our politicians going to remove self-interest and put national interests yeah. forward? So there, Russia has done nothing wrong. Absolutely I'm nothing wrong. There is no fault on their part. And Russia is doing something actually good. Because you know. before, there was one we grew up reading a lot of literature about Russia being a closed you know, space. And now, that they're space, they're opening up. Showing us what their of presidential palace looks like, the president moving around, making more friends. It's good for Russia. I but know. this is time for Nigerians, particularly those that we have in put in decision making circles. What is in it for? What are they doing? I don't what think are that they most thinking? Think What's that plan most people say if Nigeria are corrupt, they tend to say Russia are not far behind. So, but Russia have the sense, and we don't have the. I, as I, much don't, sense. Think, I, I, I don't think. I don't even now. agree with those statistics. Do, when Nigerians I, I, launder money, where do they take it to? When you speak of, well, again, where, do, where are Nigerians hiding their billions? They're not hiding it in Nigeria. It means that this is even unsafe for them to keep their money. Those <laughs> entities, we are, those spaces. I, I just, I just want to ask, no, no, I want to no, ask no, no, Kenneth. Just, said anything, so I, don't I, I just want to quickly that you mm. should please just do a little, no, no, do a little wow. research mm. on Russia. Yeah. They never leave their their friends behind. Absolutely. Mm, that if they come in, right? Like, no, uh, no, it's true. It they like never sentiment. leave you behind. They commit once they commit, except you default, they would they would stick up to their, their own end of the, the promise. No, yes, they would benefit. You know, everybody it's, it's all about interest. Do you understand? Ajakuta failed because we failed our own end of the bargain. We failed. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like they intentionally it was a huge project and they committed a whole lot I'm of not resources and funds. But I, I don't have anything so, to and, and here it, so clearly I'll, they I'll have put it. their money or where their mouth is. They've given us twelve this same MiG aircraft we've been begging countries all over the world to give us arms. Yeah, this, this thing is yeah, going to get to Nigeria to without the question, all the limitations. They They're not because the now they've seen that this country, Nigeria has always been very strategic yeah. for them. Right. To every but power. at the time, they came long before, I mean, after all the, the interest was there. But we didn't want to, you know, associate with the... You know, then it was uh, the we're communist, or we're, we're more Western. I'll be the skeptic in the midst. You know, I like so Russia. So Let's I like advantage. I, I think for me, the most important thing is that, as you said, every nation should look after his own interest. So really, the, it falls onto the hands of those negotiating. Yeah. So if they don't negotiate to the best, to our interest, we're yeah. going to lose out. Yeah. But if they negotiate properly, I think it's a good thing. I personally am a fan. It's an opportunity. I don't know about shaking hands, Shabba. We've come to the end of our journey on this edition of The Advocate. However, a default disposition of The Advocate is to keep on keeping on. So keep your comments coming in our social media platforms on Facebook, Plus TV Africa, hashtag The Advocate NG, or on Twitter and Instagram at Plus TV Africa, hashtag The Advocate NG. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Plus TV Africa. Till next week, same time, let's keep advocating for a better society. Welcome to The Advocate, a program that thrashes out all the topical issues of the day. When you are in government, you don't see nothing wrong mm, with exactly. whatever is happening. The moment you are out there, 
everything is that wrong. Is, yeah? You can't even see yes. many women now, and when they're there, they're not even really making a mark, and then they have an NYSC problem, and this is that. Really? It's disastrous for a president to, even to be unaware. unaware of it, the chief it's justice. It's a ploy. It could be a strategy. That strategy was it's a very, terrible. Like <laughs> terrible strategy. <laughs> because the box stops at your table. Whether it's that we don't look after our cities, and quite frankly, Nigeria is becoming a very ugly place. Mm. When you are the only one feeding the people with this news and there is nobody countering them, it becomes, you know, the, the news.